Um, I don't know that I've ever been part of a uh, talk of people that are so different in background from the FBI to wrestling to whatnot. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about t today about this project. Um, I want to start with a little background behind the project. Uh, I come from literary study. Uh, my PhD is actually in uh, English literature, and I found myself at an I school primarily because in um, the humanities we are also becoming uh, well acquainted with big data uh, as our texts get digitized. Uh, so I started um, my study uh, thinking about texts, um, and that soon became uh, thinking about sound um, and what it would mean if, uh, you know, we're getting pretty good at searching text and looking at text and categorizing text and uh, teaching with text. Um, what about sound? Um, so driving research questions for me were really to think through what it means to study culture through sound recordings. As you can see from the previous quote um, from Charles Bernstein, who's one of the directors of Penn Sound, a really large archive of sound recording projects of poetry recordings. Uh, you know, you're in a poetry classroom, you're typically looking at an anthology, you're typically looking at a poem on the page. What would it mean to study poetry if you could actually uh, pass around recordings in the classroom, which you would think would be easier than it, than it is, but think about annotating a recording or think about a student pulling a recording apart and writing a, writing a paper about it. It's not as simple as it sounds. So some of the research behind this is to really think through what that means to uh, teach and research with sound recordings as opposed to text. Um, what is the acoustic experience? What, what does it mean to talk about sound? Um, and what impact does certain kinds of um, ways of accessing sound, what, does that, what impact does that have on how we study and, and teach with sound? So my talk is basically divided into three parts. Um, they're not of equal length. Uh, and the first is to introduce the project to you, and then the second and the third parts are to look at a couple of case studies. Um, the project is called High Performance Sound Technologies and Access and Scholarship. HIPSTAS is, is an acronym that I thought was funny when I was alone in my office and I didn't really think it was going to get funded. Um, so, so now I, I run around uh, with, this, with this acronym, which it, there's nothing really actually all that hip about the project. I'm not even sure if I know what hip means, but maybe that is the definition of hip. I'm not sure. Um, so it's been funded twice very generously by the National Endowment for the Humanities. The first a uh, round of funding was for, an advanced, was for advanced topics in the humanities out of um, the Office of Digital Humanities. And the basic idea was to bring together some people to work with software um, who hadn't done that kind of thing before. Uh, the second grant is out of preservation and access to sort of um, to make the software usable. So I'm going to show you a little bit about that. But first, um, the team is uh, useful to know about in terms of understanding what we're doing and why we started doing it. Um, my collaborators are all at the University of Illinois. Uh, they are research programmers and research scientists. And then you'll notice this, this strange aberration, the biologist at the bottom. Um, the software was actually built by David Chang for David Enstrom. David Enstrom is an ornithologist, and he would go out and he would, um, he would record hundreds of thousands of hours of, of, of sound uh, because he wanted to research bird calls. And um, he asked David Chang, who is a um, machine learning expert, a big data expert, um, but also a musician and a person who has expertise in signal processing, if he could build him some software to do machine learning on his sound collections. The basic idea being that David Enstrom would go, he would do his recordings, and he'd be looking for bird calls in the recordings, and he didn't want to sit and listen to every single second of it, because that's a lot of time. He wanted the machine to find the bird calls in all of these recordings. Um, so this, the, the really reductive uh, you know, explanation of how machine learning works is David Enstrom would, would um, signify or tag certain recordings of birds, and then the software would go find more bird calls that were like the ones that David identified as seed examples. So I had the clever idea, well, why can't we do the same thing with um, archival recordings that humanists are interested in? Um, and maybe that would facilitate teaching with sound, doing research with sound, and scholarship with sound. Um, and so that first grant was to bring together these researchers, so archivists and humanist scholars um, and advanced graduate students in the humanities and information science, and allow them to use David Chang's software on collections of interest to them. Um, some of the collections that we ingested at the beginning were Penn Sound. They have about 30,000 audio files. Um, Folklore from the Dolph Briscoe Center for American History at UT 
And we were also working with people who were interested in Native American projects at the American Philosophical Society, which is about 50 tribes in 3,000 hours. Um, so our big data doesn't sound as big data as, um, as, the previous, as the previous conversation, but it is big data for humanists. Humanists are often working with one book, um, one, one person, one poet, one, 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 not many, many. Um, uh, other people that came as participants were coming from the Library of Congress, they were coming from StoryCorps, they were coming from other collections. There, there are sound collections everywhere. I put this slide up just to, to demonstrate that there are small and large collections of these things all over the place. Uh, and our primary goal was to create a research environment in which users could better access and analyze a spoken word. Um, and this required us to assess what scholars were already doing with sound. That was part of the, um, the impetus of the first meeting. Um, but it's also to sort of figure out, well, what kind of technological infrastructure would we need if you have 20 humanists in a room and they want to search 30,000 hours of, of audio? Um, what, what does that actually entail in terms of data processing? And then finally, running some tests to see, okay, well, well can we do this? You know, given that we have a better understanding of the kinds of questions that they want to ask and the kind of infrastructure that, that's involved, if we actually do this kind of thing, does stuff come back that people are actually interested in? Uh, this is an example of a spectrogram. Um, so the Arlo software, as I indicated with the example about the bird calls, it's not about speech recognition. We're, we're not doing that. Um, we're really interested in other aspects of, of sonic meaning, meaning making. So timbre and tone and rhythm. Think of all the things that you would be interested in a poem that, that makes meaning alongside the words but isn't just the words. Um, so Arlo makes these kinds of spectrograms uh, and allows a user to come in, and I'll show you an example in a minute, tag these up. Um, this is actually frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. This is Gertrude Stein, a recording of Gertrude Stein saying some such thing. And you can see the three, the three words. Um, the intensity is uh, black is the coolest and white is the um, most intense. This is the other aspect of it. So we actually have it, um, that infrastructure aspect is we have it installed on the super computer cluster at uh, the University of Texas right now um, in order to kind of do this kind of processing over 30,000 files. Uh, the collection that we ran, one of our first collection, our tests on was Penn Sound, as I described. Um, Penn Sound has recordings all the way back to Walt Whitman up into the present day, and they're constantly adding files. Um, at present time, as of March 1st, there were about 35,000 files. We had to do some deduplication, some pre-processing. That's the other thing that you don't hear about in data is how much cleaning up and pre-processing has to happen in order to do anything with data. Um, and so what we ended up doing was collecting, we wanted to look for applause in Penn Sound, people clapping. And we, uh, the third bullet point up there is we took three second examples across about 2,000 files and we collected 274 examples of applause and 582 examples of non-applause so that we can ask the machine, you know, find me those areas of applause versus the non-applause. I um, mean, we ended up predicting about uh, applying that, uh, the machine's prediction on 1,948 files because those duplications came back. So I'm gonna play a little example for you of what it looks like to see um, some applause in, pen, in uh, Arlo, if it plays. This was the problem we thought we were going to have. Did we figure out the little movies won't play? Okay. All right, we'll try it one more time, and then we'll and then we'll just imagine. Okay, that's what applause sounds like. So then the human being, this is actually what applause looks like. The human being comes in. It was actually a really clever little thing that the poet said, so I was hoping to entertain you, but you seem to be entertained anyways. Um, and so a user comes in and says, okay, I just want to take this little example here. I'm going to draw a box around this on the spectrogram. Here you go, machine. Here's an example. And then the machine comes back. This example is over in green on the left, um, and it comes back with other examples. Think about, you know, you're basically searching sound with sound, and it comes back and says, are these sounds like the sounds that you want, that you're looking for? The data behind it looks like this. Um, and you pull out different kinds of data. So what you see there is the file ID, the next column is the time, so the first second, then a second and a half, then two seconds, 
in two and a half seconds, et cetera. And then the machine makes a prediction whether at that point in time applause is happening or is not happening. Um, and the number is the higher number is the higher predicted value that it is happening. So if you visualize data like this, what you get is um, on the y-axis, again, you have the probability the machine thinks that there's applause happening during this file. And along the bottom, you have time. So the machine has said that, you know, look, it looks like somebody's applauding at the end of this poetry performance. Um, we see that again and again in the collection. Um, sometimes you see people who get a lot of applause for a long time, and you say, okay, well, why do I, you know, what, why is this person getting so much applause? Um, and we made little multiples, and you can see it across the file. Now, this is kind of nice if you're someone who's looking for applause, right? Like, this would be a nice search result to get. Um, or you might see some examples like these. There's applause at the beginning, at the end. Somebody gets, you know, the, the whole thing starts, you applaud, and then you applaud at the end. So you see a bunch of those. Um, what's interesting, though, is when you start to see things like this, and you start to question, well, what's happening before the applause, right? Um, and you might say, if you're interested in um, who's introducing these people, you might be interested in knowing where the applause starts and where it keeps going. So we see a bunch of these examples, a bunch of those. Um, for group readings, uh, you can see applause as a delimiter between people who are speaking, and as a scholar, you might like to know who gets more applause in a reading. You know, that guy towards the end, not so much applause, you know? Um, why? We see a bunch of those. Um, for single performances, applause can show up as a delimiter between readers. Which poems get the most applause? So this is one person reading a bunch of their poems. Ooh, oh, man, that one poem did not go off well. You know, and that's interesting to a scholar because they might say, okay, well, what poems and what venues are actually more, um, you know, drawing more response from the audience? Um, we also saw this interesting uh, aberration where we saw applause happening about two-thirds of the way through a single performance or a single person who was performing. Um, and we started to think, well, maybe there was this poem and they had this sort of denouement and this, this climax of poetic gesture and, and the audience just stood up and, you know, applauded in the middle of this poem. Um, and that's really not what we saw. Um, what we did see was that there would be applause before the end, before questions. But again, for people who are studying these kinds of performances, that's interesting. They want to know what kinds of questions are being elicited for certain kinds of audiences, et cetera. And you see a bunch of those. Are there mistakes? Yes, there are mistakes. Um, if a strong hiss is there, the machine thought those were applause. Um, dissonant music, they thought that was applause and um, the bagpipe. That's definitely applause. <laughs> so um, all of this is to say that this, these, these kinds of interventions are not perfect. Um, it takes a little you know, thinking about, well, what, what sound indicators are in there that might be of interest to people, um, and using those to your advantage. But this is, a, this is a view of a sound archive that we do not currently have. Um, what other kinds of questions can you ask about? You know, you might be interested in gender. Which, which gender? Who gets more applause? If somebody's um, more advanced in their career, do they get more or less applause? If they're sort of in the village versus at a university, do they get more applause? These are kinds of questions that are interesting. These kinds of questions cannot happen, though, if, if our metadata is in a, is in a blob, right? Um, so that was the other thing that we found, is that even if we do a lot of this sound analysis, um, if we don't have good metadata to orient, you know, um, as I showed you on the one slide, someone might be interested in, in who's doing the introduction. If we don't have the information about who's doing the introduction um, in, in a way that it's pulled out, it's hard to kind of negotiate that data against that information as well. So this is kind of an example of yucky metadata that you would need to sort of pull out in all of these ways in order to make it meaningful. These are publications that we did on this, on this work. Um, these are just a couple more examples that I'm going to spin through. They're all on Jacket 2, which is a magazine associated with Penn Sound. I encourage you to go there. Um, this particular person, Chris Mustaza, who's also a hipster's participant, was interested in um, noise as the content. So he wanted to know the provenance of recordings. And so he had some recordings that he knew the provenance of. And he um, found some sort of sound tags in there that would allow him to say where other recordings had been recorded. Um, this is Eric Retberg. He was interested in laughter um, and the extent to which when an audience laughs, it has, a, it has a meaningful impact on what happens in poetry. Ken Sherwood was interested in, you know, what if one, poem, what, what if one poet uh, actually comes and, uh, you know, does, does the same poet but very differently in different venues? You know, can we, can we look at those kinds of differences? Um, even though the words are all the same, the way they say the words will be different. And then this is Merritt MacArthur, who was interested in the, um, the incantation 
of poetry performances and why they all talk like this. Uh, another uh, sort of use case that we were interested in is um, a folklore collection at the University of Texas. Um, the, uh, what we did was we had about 219 hours of recordings, 455 files. We tagged about 4,000 two-second windows with um, instrument spoken and sung. These are field recordings that go from about 1926 to the 60s. And imagine, you know, people going out into the field and they're recording people who are singing, they're getting tales from them. Um, sometimes people are singing over an instrument, sometimes people are singing a cappella. And so we wanted to be able to kind of um, to map the terrain of these recordings such that you could see when these things were happening, these genre changes were happening. This is um, a uh, John Allen Lomax recordings. There's about 55 of them in that collection from 1926 to 1941. And again, this is a, um, it's kind of hard to see, but this is a, a display of the collection that you don't normally get, right? So the, um, what you have here is the blue is someone singing, um, the red is the machine predicting that there's an instrument happening, and the green is, is someone who's, um, is if there's speech. And so when you see red and blue happening at the same time, more than likely it's somebody singing with an instrument. Um, and what you see, you know, if you're an archivist or you're a scholar and you're coming to this, you might be particularly interested in this section that I have squared here, which seems to be someone playing an instrument and then they, and then they start singing. Um, here's another sort of illustration of that uh, dynamic. The blue is, is an instrument and the orange is someone speaking. Um, and you might care to know when, you know, if, you're, if you've got recordings of Bob Dylan, you might like to know what Bob Dylan is saying in between his sets, right? Um, and this is a, a, a view that you don't normally get of a collection. What this is, is um, it's across time, it's the collection, and what you have is um, the blue is the total number of seconds of a recording. Um, they're going across time to the right. The red is when someone is speaking, the number of seconds someone is speaking in the file. The green is the number of seconds someone's playing an instrument, and the purple is the number of seconds that someone is singing. Um, the little movie, if it played, would go across time and you would see what I was particularly interested in is, is how much more time was spent on people who were speaking in the files. Because as field recorders, um, John Lomax, for example, was going out into the field, he was primarily, inter primarily interested in collecting songs, but was not too interested in speaking to the people. He didn't really want to know their stories. He wanted their songs. This trend changes over time for a number of reasons. Um, it, Recording got cheaper, uh, you know, the recording equipment got lighter, uh, reels got longer. Um, but what's interesting is even when the recordings across this viewpoint change in time and more speaking happens, the recordings don't seem to get longer. So there's something else going on there. There's an actual cultural impetus to collect more stories from people than just going and taking um, their songs. And I'm using those words deliber deliberately. Um, but anyways, the point is, is this is an interesting viewpoint into the sound recordings as data based on kinds of questions that would be interesting to scholars. Uh, and I'm writing, I'm putting this up there because I'm writing a little bit on this on the Sound Studies blog. So if you're in, uh, sounding out, so if you're interested in, in hearing more about that particular thing, then, then you can go there because uh, we're out of time today. But uh, I wanted to end sort of with a, with, a, with a note. So when we were talking to scholars and we're talking to the archivists, what they were interested in in terms of sound dynamics for these collections was um, talking about tempo or pitch or tone or timbre or dynamics or laughter or silence, all of these things that indicate you know, what people are doing and how people make meaning um, and how we make meaning with our cultural artifacts. Um, but if you're using a system like Arlo, you also have to be adept at damping ratios and gain and frequencies and spectra and energy and pitch energy. And the kinds of questions that I'm asking are, are really a, a, to figure out, you know, where do those two things meet? You know, how do you work with scholars so that they can, they can work with these kinds of, of tools to figure out what the data means? And that's the end. Thank you. <laughs>